Hi everyone, thanks for being here. My name is Louis. Um, I work for A9 and we're going to do metaprogramming. So, um, I'd like to have a show of hands. Uh, who is familiar with HANA? Okay, who has used it? That's actually pretty good. Okay, so if you're not familiar at all, you should consider going to one of the two other excellent talks because, <laughs> I mean, seriously, this is going to be, a, I, I, I'm just going to give a very short introduction to what HANA is and then we're going to basically have just examples, uh, you know, straight until the end of the talk. Um, okay, so um, HANA is a library like Fusion, uh, essentially, that allows you to um, uh, do algorithms on heterogeneous sequences, right? So algorithms on, on tuples, essentially. Uh, and by providing a way to represent types as values, it's also able to solve the same set of problems as MPL does. Um, and the benefit is that we get uh, value syntax, so you know, closer to the usual C++ syntax uh, than, than MPL, where angle brackets are a little too common. Uh, and so it provides a tuple, the map and the set, which are, it provides other data, data structures, but these are really the, uh, the, um, uh, the fundamental uh, pieces. Uh, shout out to uh, Jason here, who implemented the hash table um, that, that is used for the map. And it provides algorithms like remove if, find if, you know, uh, essentially a, a, a subset of the standard library, but it's, it's close to, uh, it doesn't provide everything, but it, it's pretty close to that. Uh, and all of these algorithms, obviously, uh, they do not operate on iterators, they, they operate on uh, uh, tuples, for example. Um, and then it provides some utilities like uh, integral constants, uh, HANA type, and HANA string, uh, which are essentially, uh, you know, uh, integral constant is a way to represent integers at compile time. And uh, the HANA type is just a way to represent the type, uh, normal C++ types as an object and HANA string is, is a compile time string, essentially. Um, and so, just to give a little example of how that works, so if I have, if I have normally an MPL, if I have a MPL vector, which contains you know, a bunch of types, and I wanna do a, uh, I don't wanna remo remove the, uh, the void, the void uh, types from, that, from that, um, that sequence, I just use MPL remove if, and then I pass in my, ty my type level sequence and I, I pass in then a like, uh, type level lambda, right, which is called the MPL lambda expression, saying std is void MPL un, um, uh, underscore one. And what that means essentially is you're gonna call std is void on the first type argument that you're being passed and you're, you're gonna you know, give the result. And so you remove everything that satisfies that type level lambda. Uh, and what you get is obviously a MPL vector of int, char, and long. Uh, and then just the same, you can use MPL transform, for example, to map a, um, to map a type level function here, a type level lambda on your sequence of types. Okay, and so the reason why they have to do that, um, by the way, is the code? Yeah, the code's fine. Um, so the reason why they have to do that, to do it that way, let me know if at some point uh, like you can't see the, the code because things are not sized properly. Um, so the reason why they have to, to, to have this kind of type level lambda thing is because uh, uh, they can't use you know, normal lambdas because they're all at the type level, right? Uh, on the other hand, if you use HANA because everything is represented as an object, you can just use a normal, a normal lambda. So here, as you can see, um, so I have my type level sequence, right? which is actually an object. Notice here that it's auto types, right? So it's really an object, that's, that's really important. That's basically a tuple that contains HANA types, okay? And then I call my HANA remove if algorithm on that, and I pass in just a straight normal lambda. I don't have to, I don't need like a special domain specific language to represent lambdas because I can just use whatever the language gives me. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that can be really handy. And then just the same, I can you know, use HANA transform and then pass in the lambda. Notice that this is a generic lambda, so what's happening here is basically I'm, getting, I'm, I'm being passed a HANA type uh, on each, which for, for each element of the tuple, which is a different HANA type, this lambda here it gets instantiated, right? So the operator parens of the lambda gets instantiated with a different HANA type. And essentially then I just call the trait on that and we're good. 
questions at this point? Good. Yeah. Are there limitations to what can be in the Lambda body? Are there limitations uh, regarding what can be in the Lambda body? Uh, no. I mean, it's just a normal Lambda. Uh, all, all that matters really is that you're returning a, uh, an integral constant here, a Boolean integral constant, so that the algorithm, when it calls your Lambda, can say basically the decal type of that Lambda, was this true or false? Right, at compile time. If you return a true or a false, like a bool, um, uh, it's not gonna work because the algorithm is gonna be like, you, you know, the return type of the, the lambda is, is bool. Okay, but it, was that a true bool or a false bool? I can't tell, right? So that's the, uh, really the only important thing. Um, and yeah, um, if you put side effects in there, it's also not gonna be great. Uh, <laughs> so, so you probably don't see too many captures. Um, so the question is, so you don't, you probably don't see too many captures. No, actually, uh, we're going to see later on. I, I use captures pretty heavily, but I don't care about the state of the captures. I just care about their type usually, uh, the, the you know this, the, the type of the captured variables. But we're going to see examples uh, later on. Um, okay, so now let's yeah. What about stateful lambdas? Are they allowed, or does that not work? With the question is, are, are stateful lambdas allowed? Yes, they're allowed. Yeah, yeah, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, it's just a normal lambda, really. Um, although the library doesn't like the library um, documents, basically that it, whatever you put in there, doesn't mean that it's going to be called ever. And in fact, what we do is we just decal type it, right? So if you were to say like std c out something, you don't know whether it's called. If you, if it's called, you don't know how many times, and you don't know in what order, right? So that's why I'm saying like you don't want to put the side effects there. Um, and then so. Here's an example with Fusion. So with Fusion, it's, it's a little bit different, right? Fusion, uh, so MPL just works with types. Fusion works with heterogeneous objects, right? And uh, so it's, it's also essentially a, a, a library that provides algorithms on tuples. And their tuple, instead of being called tuple, it's called vector. And so here I create essentially a tuple. And notice that like this has nothing to do with const expert. This is not compile time stuff here. This, S literal here creates a std string, right? Is the std string literal thing. So, um, so there's an allocation there, and like it's all very runtime. Yet, each element of the of the vector here has a different type. And then, and then I can use fusion remove if, again with the same kind of type level lambda that I had before for MPL to say you're going to remove things from my vector, which are which satisfy this predicate, which which is basically uh, you know are you a floating point? Okay. Uh, and then, well, that's the result that I get. Okay, so um, you can, you, what happens here, you can think of it as, uh, it's a little bit as if you were to figure out which, which elements in the vector are floating points, and then you would just create a new vector uh, saying uh, stood, a new tuple saying stood get for each index where it is not a floating point, right? It's, it's exactly what Fusion does under the hood, uh, almost exactly. Uh, and for HANA, it's basically the same. So um, I create a tuple, and then the difference, though, is because I represent types as values, uh, I can just pass a normal lambda. And here, what happens is I actually get past a ref, a const ref, to the um, element inside the, the the tuple, and then I say, okay, give me the type of that element, and then check whether it's a floating point. So that type ID here, you can think of it as to type ID kind of, uh, just type ID actually, uh, but um, it's, except it's, it's a compile time. So it returns a HANA type that contains the, the type of the object that you passed it. Okay, questions at this point? Okay. Um, so that was for vector or tuple, and uh, HANA also provides, HANA also provides um, uh, a map, which is probably the most uh, useful uh, uh, data structure, I think. Uh, and so in Fusion, you map essentially keys, which are tags, ju just types. Uh, you map that to elements of your, of your map, which are runtime objects that may have different types, okay? So it's like a tuple, except it's indexed not on indices, it's indexed on types, okay? Uh, and then you can query, so you build your map that way. So here you associate A to one, B to X, and C to hello. And then you can query, give me the, the key that's at this or that, um, give me the value that's associated to this or that key. All 
All right, and with HANA, it's almost the same, um, except, except you create your map by specifying the mapping uh, with, uh, with a pair like this, and, and I'm using HANA type to wrap the, the actual type inside an object so that I can use this, this syntax essentially, right? So it's a little bit more verbose, but if you have like, you know, 50 of those, uh, uh, it's, much, it's much easier to see which key is associated to which, which value. Um, and then since we're working with objects, we don't have to use this fancy fusion at key angle bracket A, right? We can just start using the normal operators and it's much easier. So this example is a little bit convoluted because what I have is a struct A and then I need to myself say, you know, map, square bracket, HANA type, blah, blah, blah. And that's a little bit annoying. But if you just, if you're past a HANA type, T, for example, it, it's really nice to just say like map of T and you're, and you're done, right? So, um, so that, that's, that's an interesting, uh, uh, I think, point for uh, uh, syntactic sugar. Yep. Is there a reason you're not using type C? Is there a reason why I'm not using type C? Yeah, um, I've grown to not like that so much. I'm not sure it was the best design decision. I, so I, I'm, I, uh, there's no reason. <laughs> there's, there's no reason, it's just. Why is it a bad design? Uh, I don't know, like I said, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of, um, uh, we can take that offline. Uh, he's a contributor, so like he knows the nitty gritty details, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a few different ways that you can write this, this thing here. Uh, and now I'm just using one, which is equivalent to another one. And, and initially the library, we, the library was, was designed with the other one in mind. And, but yeah, I'm kind of, it doesn't matter really. So we can talk about this later. Um, okay, no questions or questions? Good, okay, now we can start having fun. So um, we're gonna do spirit essentially, but very, very tiny spirit, okay? Uh, very, very tiny stupid spirit, but just to show the, uh, the idea. Um, and so our goal is to create a parser, to create multiple small parsers, right? That, that, ju that just do one thing and then we can combine them into larger parsers and um, profit. So here I create a parser that's gonna parse an int, parser that's gonna parse a stud string, and then parse a double. And basically what I say is you have to have a literal open parens, so that's also a parser here, which just parses a, an open parens. And then after that it has to follow an int, and then a comma, and then a stud string, and then a comma, and a double, and so on, right? And then I just combine all these things saying like one should come after the other. And the goal is given some text, I should be able to just call my parser on the text. So by the way, this, it means that this combined parser here returns something that can be called. Okay, okay. Um, and it's going to return to me a tuple that contains the things that I cared about, the things that I parsed. And notice that even though the literals here are also parsers, I don't care about their value. I just care that they are there. And so we're gonna have to somehow figure out which parsers, you know, which parsers need to actually re re return something or, or you know, the return value of which parsers I should, I should care about and then, and, and then keep in the result. And so the idea is after combining the parsers, I call my parser here and then I just get whatever was parsed in a tuple. Yeah. Is that, is that a chi lit? Is, is that a what? Is that lit from Qi? Uh, oh yeah, is that, is that like a, a lit from Qi? What, what it, it was inspired by that, but I mean, you, you know, we're gonna, so we're, we're gonna implement that essentially. We're gonna implement all of this, but, but yeah, it was obviously uh, taken from, from Spirit. Um, okay, so any questions on the application? Yeah? Uh, what exactly is the difference between HANA tuple and standard tuple? What is the difference between HANA tuple and standard tuple? Uh, HANA tuple is not strictly standard conforming. It's really hard to be compiling efficient and strictly standard conforming. Uh, so it's like, uh, I, I'm gonna be bold and say like an order of magnitude faster. Uh, it's not quite true, but almost, uh, but you don't get stuff like the um, capital explicit constructors, for example, and there's a few, like you don't have the allocator constructors, but I personally don't. Like, so HANA is more tailored, based, HANA, HANA tuple is more tailored towards metaprogramming where the compile times are more important than some fancy features that the standard tuple provides. Uh, it also provides an operator like the, bra the bracket so that instead of std get, you can just use bracket with an integral constant and um, a few other things like that. 
You had a question. Yeah, so I'm wondering uh, if there's a technical reason why you had combined partials as a function instead of just putting together those partials with uh, an operator overload like screenwise or just taste. So, so, so the, the question is, um, is there a reason why I'm using combined parser as a function as opposed to combining the parser with like operator overload like Spirit does? It's because it doesn't fit on, uh, is it, this is a talk, like a you know, 90 minute talk, so I didn't want to get into operator overload and stuff. Actually, we'll have some fun with that later, but yeah, it's just a matter of, um, um, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's just technical detail for the purpose of this presentation. Okay, alrighty. Um, so before we can actually start implementing that, uh, we're just gonna have a quick dive into compile time type information. So I kind of glanced um, uh, over that earlier with the type ID stuff. Uh, so essentially when you say HANA type ID, it returns a HANA type like that, right? Which contains the actual type of the object that you, that you add. It strips like reference and CV qualifiers, if I remember correctly, uh, because otherwise you get insane. Uh, and then HANA, provides traits which are strictly equivalent to the std uh, type traits, except they work on HANA types and they return HANA types instead of working on C++ types at the type level and returning C++ types at the type level. So they're, they're, they're just wrapped basically. They, they just take whatever is in the, the HANA type, apply the, the equivalent std trait, and then wrap that back in a, HANA, uh, in a HANA type, right? So they're just basically the lift of the std traits, um, std type traits to the HANA world the value world. Uh, and so given a type like that, you can, uh, you can manipulate it. For example, this is equivalent to std is same. So you can just compare types and it's gonna return an integral constant saying, are these two types the same? Um, and so on. And the way that works is pretty simple. Essentially, you can define HANA type as being just a, uh, an empty wrapper like that. And then you just use function templates to implement this stuff. Right, so if I wanna say add pointer, this is not actually how it's implemented in HANA. Like I said, I'm, I, I use the std type traits to do that, but this is the idea of how you can implement something equivalent to the, the type traits header using this paradigm of, of working with values instead of just normal C++ types. So here, add pointer is just pattern matching on a type, and given a type T, I'm just returning a type T pointer. And the interesting thing is, notice that how I, I just return an, a, a default constructed type. Through this, I don't care about the value of these things, they're empty anyway, right? This is, all of this is just a, um, is, is, is just a, a masquerade to, to, to use the compiler's ability to do auto return type deduction uh, and for me to work with objects, but I don't really care about the state of these types. That's why I'm just like, you know, passing empty things around. And all I care about these things that I'm passing around is just that they're type. That's the only thing I care about. So um, you'll see me do a lot of, today you'll see me do a lot of, of these like returning empty, empty types and just default constructing them and like, doesn't matter. Um, and so if you wanna compare two types, again, you can use, this is equivalent essentially to uh, implementing std is same. Any questions on this? Good. Um, and so if we implement a basic parser, uh, given a T, and yeah, this is like a stupid implementation, but this, just an example, right? Um, uh, if it were like spirit, it would probably take like two iterators or something like that. Um, and so given a T and an input stream, I just parse the, 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 the result that I'm expecting, I just parse that in from, from the input stream and then I return that. And then I create a, uh, I have this parse convenience method here, which just allows me to create a parser. Um, doesn't actually save me anything, but yeah. So um, that's how I can implement a basic parser. Then for a literal parser, I'm just gonna ignore one character. And I'm gonna return void underscore, which is just a dummy placeholder type saying, I don't care about what I'm returning. Because as we saw at the beginning, um, I have these literal parsers and I, I, I want to kind of discard the result of whatever, whatever they parse, right? This, this, the combined parser is going to have to just keep the results from the three middle parsers, the, the ints, the string, and whatever. And, uh, and void is not a regular type, so I can't just return void and be happy with it. So I'm going to use that, uh, like on next slides, next slide to, um, to just signal that I'm, I'm returning nothing interesting and you should skip me, essentially, 
Okay, everybody good now? All right. And yeah, um, I have this, uh, this helper function just to nicely create these literal parsers. And now if I wanna combine parsers, so let's break this down. If I wanna combine parsers, um, so I take a bunch of parsers here and then I return the lambda. And I return the lambda because remember, I wanna have the, uh, a callable interface for, my, for my, the, the resulting parser of the, you know, the parser that results of the combination of all the small parsers. So I'm returning a lambda that's gonna do the, the parsing job, the heavy lifting, lifting when you call it, okay? Um, and what I do here is, so first of all, I, so I create a tuple basically that contains the result of, of, of calling all the parsers on the input stream. And I initialize that, and at this point, the runtime value is very important because now I'm working with an actual input stream that's, that has a runtime you know, content, and, and I'm interested in knowing what is the actual runtime objects that I can parse out of that. So uh, default constructing this tuple here would be very wrong. So I, I construct this tuple with the result of calling each parser on the input, input stream. I am doing something really, really clever and subtle here. I'm using the initialize the braces, the initializer list to sequence the order in which the parsers are called on the input stream. Because inside a function call, the order is on, is is uh, you know is not defined. Right. But not. I was agreeing with you. Okay, yeah, not in 14 at least. Uh, and actually, did that make it? Yeah, they're, they're, they're still not specified. Okay, so it's still not I mean, specified. There, there were there was a proposal. That's why I'm, I'm saying. People with backends and optimizers push back. Okay, yeah, okay. So, so Marshall says uh, there was a proposal, but people with backends, uh, uh, working on backends and optimizers push back. So it uh, seems like we're not getting that, at least not for 17. So anyway, so, so, so but here I'm safe anyway, because even in, in you know, 11 and 14, this is guaranteed to, uh, this is the, the order of evaluation is guaranteed. So I call the first parser, then the second parser, and every time the parser just slurps something from the input stream, and so it updates the state of the stream and so it's essentially the same as if you were calling it uh, by hand. Um, and then, so I have mo all my results, but I don't care about all of them. Like I said, I don't care about the literal parser's result. So that's where HANA comes into play, really. Um, and I'm just gonna remove, I'm gonna scan all the, the results and I'm just gonna remove those that are the, the void underscore, right? My tag type that I, that I, that I created before. So I'm just saying, Remove things that are void, so which I don't care about, and then I return my result, and I'm done. And you know, I could be more clever and like stood move here, but that wouldn't fit on the slide. So, but the idea is just I'm, I'm using Hana here to filter my tuple. Any questions on that, on that example? Um, yep. With, with the literals, have we seen a matching, or like the open parentheses literal? Does it care about what came from the input stream? Will it throw if the stream doesn't match? The question here is, will it, what, what's gonna happen if the stream doesn't match? Match what this literal was initialized with, the open brand, for example. Well, so I'm just ignoring one character. What exactly, I'm, I'm not an expert of um, uh, iOS stream. Again, like this is kind of a, a like normally you would, you would set up a proper, I'm gonna parse from iterators or something like that. And I'm gonna have like probably a mechanism to do even some look ahead and whatever. But um, so uh, I guess if you try to ignore one character like that, and that's it's not the right character. There's probably like a, a not, not quite a fail bit, but something like that set in the input stream. Uh, I would say nothing's good is going to happen, probably. Um, uh, like, probably the, the subsequent parsers will fail or something like that. Um, so, again, I mean, this is not a don't go and copy paste this and then use that at work. <laughs> like, come on, like, you can use the idea and then make something better out of it. And, like, if you need help, send me an email, that's fine. But, like, just don't copy paste as is. This is like a uh, you know, talk example kind of. Um, all right, any more questions on that example? Okay, moving on. So we're gonna do a, a minimal dimensional analysis library, uh, very minimal. So um, we don't like to crash, uh, was it a Mars rover or, no, no, it was a, you know, something crashed because of, a, yeah. Uh, yeah, because of like a, a imperial versus um, a, a metric uh, a, a mismatch, uh, that's stupid. That's just plain stupid. We all agree with that. Uh, yet we still don't have anything really standard. Um, although we do have boost units, um, and 
So essentially, we're going to do a minimal uh, version of that. So let's say I have this code. Um, uh, there is a problem on line four because, no, there's a problem on, on line seven because I'm, I'm multiplying my mass by my uh, velocity as opposed to my acceleration, okay? I want to catch that. Um, and so the trick for that is to attach um, uh, units to my quantities, right? To say this quantity is, is velocity, this quantity is this other thing, and then you know that you can't possibly um, you can't possibly initialize like force from something that doesn't match. So the idea is we want a compiler error on that line and this is supposed to work properly. Okay, and what we're gonna do today is implement these things. Anybody has a question about the, the use case? Okay, so, um, but before we can do that, we gotta introduce a little thing, compile time integers. So I glossed over that by talking about integral constants, but now we're gonna dive a little bit deeper in that. Um, so normally when I say just one plus two, I get an int. Everybody knows that, right? Um, and the difference here is if I say one underscore C plus two underscore C, what I'm doing is one underscore C creates an integral constant. Two underscore C creates an integral constant too. And then I overloaded the plus operator for my integral constants such that it returns an integral constant of three. And then I can, uh, uh, also, you know, I can static assert on that. And actually, this doesn't work. I need const expert here. Um, most code should compile, but not this one. Yeah. So you submitted a proposal to, for that to be standard? Uh, the underscore C? Yeah. The question is, have I no, submitted... underscore C, the plus for integral constants. Have I submitted a proposal for the plus for integral constants to be standardized? Uh, I have not. I don't think it is possible to do that on the current integral constant. It would break some code. Because right now, there's an implicit conversion to the underlying type. And so it, yeah, that's why we can't have nice things. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right, okay. So the reason why, at this point, it might seem convoluted, like why would I want integral constants if I can just use normal integers? I'm gonna gloss over that because it's kind of deep, but essentially the idea is if you pass an int to a function, even if the function's const expert, doesn't matter. From within the, the function itself, you have no idea whether that int was actually a constant expression, okay? And so what I need is to pass the, const, the, 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 the compile time value of my integer to that function so that I can, for example, static assert on that from within the body. And the only way to do that in C++ right now is to pass that as part of the type of the, the, the parameter that you're passing, or the argument that you're, that you're passing. And that's, that's essentially why these things are, are, are required. Um, and the way that works, again, so the way this is implemented is, well, so I have integral constant. It does not really differ from stood integral constant, apart for a, a little bit, um, a few things here. Then I have this, um, I have this uh, uh, user-defined literal that basically parses the number that you, that, that you, you know, put before the underscore C, it parses that at compile time, that's pretty easy to do. You know, you, have, you keep your base and then blah, 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 multiply by 10 and then you recreate the number. And you can do all of this in a const expert function and then you just create an integral constant with a proper value. So you parse the, the literal uh, and then you, you, you figure out what number that is and you give back an integral constant. And then like I said, it's possible to, to overload the operator plus um, on integral constant to do what we want. Any question on that? Okay. Um, and so now we're gonna represent quantities. Uh, and so essentially, uh, a quantity is going to be an actual value plus a bunch of dimensions, okay? And then we're gonna allow you to create a quantity from any, uh, any, any double, and we're gonna allow you to go back from a, from a you know, quantity with a dimension we're gonna allow you to go back to double, but this is explicit because we don't want implicit conversions to uh, uh, ruin the day, okay? Um, and the way we're gonna represent dimensions is, um, and so this is cropped here, but it's not really important. Um, so the way we're gonna do that is basically by um, defining a dimension, or rather a unit, as a vector of all the possible fundamental uh, um, uh, units, right, of, of the SI. And 
Um, and so there's here basically the, there's a, the number associated to a dimension um, represents the exponent for that dimension. So let's say I had mass squared, I would put a two here. And if it was one over mass, I would say minus one here. Okay, so for example, here I can have velocity is blah, blah, blah. Right, it's a uh, um, And so, and, and all of these are like multiplied. So here this is, um, this is, velocity is, and this is stupid, it always happens, right? Um, uh, uh, is distance over time, right? Uh, so that's distance, uh, power of one, times time, power minus one. So distance over time. Is everybody following me how I'm representing uh, dimensions? Okay. Um, and so now the way we're gonna catch errors is we're gonna add this, uh, this constructor here where if you try to construct a quantity from a quantity which has a dimension that is not the same, then I give you a, a static assert, essentially. Okay, another option would be to like spin away or just to disable the constructor. And I see Steven here who's wondering why, um, why I'm not just uh, basically deleting the constructor probably, is that? Well, why do we need to make this constructor a template since it only works for one other type? Right, so why do I need to make the constructor a template if it only works for another type? There is like five different ways of implementing this. This is the way I chose because I like having a nice static assert when I mess up. Uh, but this is by no means, like you could, you could do, like you could define just a none. So to me, this error message is better than saying there is no such, there is no matching constructor, for example. Um, it's, just, it's just a preference, but you could do anything else. So the comment is, um, it would never be chosen because that would be co a copy constructor. So first of all, this one is explicit, and I think that's what I want. The other thing is, um, the other thing is, um, if other dimensions is an equivalent dimension but represented slightly differently, um, for example. If it was a tuple of stood integral constant, not a tuple of HANA integral constant, it would not be the same type. Therefore, the compiler would say, oh, it doesn't match. But what I'm doing here is a deep equality check. So I'm actually checking for the value of the integral constant. So this is a little bit better. But again, this is, this is just uh, like, this is because I, I do this basically because I like the error message uh, that, that I get. But it could also be just the, the copy constructor. No, no, it's, comment is, shouldn't that be unequal? No, no, I want a static assert that they are equal. Okay. If they're not equal, then I get the, the error message, right? Okay. Uh, and then if we wanna compose dimensions, that's where it, it comes really nice, right? Um, basically, you wanna, you wanna carry the, the, um, the units of, of, your, uh, of your associated to your quantities um, when, you do, when, when you, you do arithmetic and so, and so on. Um, and the way we do that here is given two quantities, we're gonna figure out what, is, what should be the resulting dimension. And we're gonna do that by, so for, for uh, multiplication, what we want basically is to, um, is to add pairwise the, the exponents for all the dimensions, right? And so that's what I do here. I just figure out what is the resulting dimension and then I create a quantity with that resulting dimension and I extract the double value and I just do the normal uh, multiplication in, inside the, my representation, representation space, which is, which is the double, and then I stick that back into my quantity, right? And for uh, the division, it's, it's just the same. So the zip width here, thing here is essentially a binary to transform, okay? So it takes std plus and it calls it on the first element of D1 and the first element of D2. Gets the result, put that in the, puts that in the resulting tuple calls that then on the second element of, the, of D1, second element of D2, gives me a result, puts that in the result tuple, and so on. So that's just a binary transform. And again, notice that these things here, these dimensions are tuples containing integral constants. An integral constant has no runtime value. I don't care about its runtime value. I therefore do not care about the runtime value of a tuple of those. So that's why I just default construct the hell out of those, and I'm just like, 
All I care about is their type. That's all I care about. And by the way, I even decal type that. So like there's no runtime evaluation going on at all. This is just a, a strategy for me to use the, uh, the, the slightly more natural value syntax with things that are essentially types. Like all I care about these objects is their type. Again, that's really important. That is the core of the, the reasoning behind HANA. Um, if you want to be effective at using this library, this is exactly what you need to understand. Any questions on this? So the question is, what happens if I try to multiply two quantities and that gives me a dimension, a dimension that was not defined in the initial things, right? Uh, what's the error message I'm going to get? None at all. It's actually valid, right? Because uh, you can, I mean, if you, if you divide, uh, I don't know, like something fancy by some other thing fancy, it gives you another uh, dimension for which we might not have a standard name, but it's still mathematically or, you know, in physics, it, it might be valid, right? So, uh, so you don't get an error. Okay. All right. So. Just a silly question. If you're adding, if you have the operator add, uh, no need to even change the types. You just have to make sure they match up. Like you, you would just like just to complete the exercise. Operator plus would just be of the same quantities, and, and then. You'd yeah. Just be adding the yeah, so the question is, uh, if we wanted to complete this, this exercise uh, and define, for example, operator plus, operator minus, and so on. Uh, so for operator plus, all that you care is that they have the same, the same dimension because you only want to add things that are in the same dimension. So you would just check that, and then you would not need to do a, to calculate the new dimension, you know, that, you know, um, mass plus mass is going to give you mass, right? Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, again, this is crop, but it's, not, it's really no big deal. Um, so uh, now what we're going to do is actually something that I presented here last year, but it's different. Um, uh, and, uh, and we're going to go much faster over it. So, <laughs> okay, so the idea is I have an event system. I have a bunch of events, uh, and I, I want to have callbacks associated to those, those events and I want to be able to trigger those events and have the callbacks be executed, essentially. Okay, very typical. Um, so here I create my event system. I say uh, event foo is associated to, like, the, the callbacks that are associated to my event foo don't return anything and they take in a string. Okay, so it, it is expected that when I'm going to trigger the foo event, I, I should pass in a string to the callback somehow. Um, and then bar. Uh, is associated to callbacks which return void and then takes in it, right? Um, and all of those re return void, you'll see why later, but you know, you could tweak the example to make it different. Um, and then I register callbacks. So I say, when you get foo, you're gonna call this function here, this, fun this lambda, right? And the lambda, the callback expects a string, which is just here. And I can also register multiple functions for the same event. Um, and the idea is it would be really cool if, if I try to register a callback associated to an event that does not exist, I would like to get a compiler error, not a runtime error. Because we know the set of events at compile time, we know what event we are registering a callback for at compile time, there is no reason why we couldn't be clever enough to figure out that, oh, you're trying to you know, do something that doesn't make sense here, if that's what you're trying to do. Uh, and just the same, so if, when I trigger events, I need to, pa to pass in the, uh, the whatever my callback ex is expecting. And we would like to have two things. First of all, we don't want to have any overhead for event lookup. So like inside this event system, we don't want to have to say, oh, what is the set? We, we don't want to pay for looking up the set of callbacks associated to an event because we know two things at compile time. We know the set of events that we have at compile time, and we know what event we're triggering at compile time. There is no reason why there would be any runtime lookup for that. And the, the second thing that we want is if we're trying to trigger something that does not exist, that's not part of our event system, we want a compiler error for just the same reason. So the idea is, here is um, we have compile time information. Let's try to be clever and preserve it as much as possible for safety purposes and for speed purposes. 
not compile time speed, obviously. <laughs> Sometimes it's reasonable to you know, make that trade-off. Uh, and so here, obviously, we're assuming that all the events are known at compile time. And we're also assuming that we always know what event we're going to trigger at compile time. That's, you know, if, it's not, if that is not your use case, um, uh, look at my ACCU talk. Uh, I solved that other problem. But um, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. But, but here, let's say we have these constraints. That's what we can do. And actually, if we don't know what event you're going to tr uh, trigger at compile time, it's not really easy to have callbacks that take different uh, arguments. I mean, you can do it, but you're going to have to get into variance or type erasure. And so before we can actually dive into that, I need to dive a little bit deeper into compile time strings. So essentially, um, a compile time string is like a string, but it's not in compile time. That's the end of the talk. No. <laughs> so, so, um, right, so given two compile time strings, so this underscore s here acts a little bit like the s user defined literal that is provided for a std string, except it, it, it constructs a uh, compile time string instead. And then I overload the operator plus on, these, to, on these, these compile time strings so that I can concatenate compile time strings and get back a compile time string. And then I overload the, uh, the equal operator to compare them. So no, no, no big deal here, right? Um, and by the way, notice here that I'm using auto. So again, this here is some kind of weird type which represents a compile time string. It's not like a std string or even a string view or anything. It's, it has nothing to do with constexpr. The contents of this hello plus world string is encoded somehow in a string, uh, in a, sorry, in the type of the, the object that I return here. And next slide, we're going to see how that works. Okay, so the way it works essentially is um, a string is just a uh, char parameter pack, right? It's just a, a template. Uh, and so don't look at all of this at once, um, otherwise it's kind of eye bleeding. Um, so let's focus on lines one to four first. So line one here presents the, the, the container that's going to contain the compile time string. Again, it's a stupid empty object. I don't care about its runtime value ever. All I care about is that I can extract the value of my string. Given any object of that type, I can extract the value of my string at compile time because it's, it's, a, it's a template parameter. Well, it's a bunch of template parameters actually, right? Um, so if I wanted to represent like hello, like in this example, I would say string angly bracket eight, well, character h, comma, e, comma, l, comma, l, comma, o, right? And that's very verbose, very, really, really annoying to type, but we can do something better, um, which is use this uh, user-defined literal. Disclaimer, this is not standard. This is an extension supported by Clang and GCC, and we have tried to get it in the standard three times or four times now, and every time the, the answer is no. So um, this is non-standard, but for all intents and purposes, it's going to work with, the, like, if you're applying these techniques, you probably don't care about MSVC. So, so, <laughs> yes. If you get the answer no from the standard committee, it means try again harder. So the, the comment is, if you get the answer no by the standard committee, the, uh, uh, what you have to do is just try again harder. Um, there is a good reason why the answer is no. Uh, it's very unfortunate because uh, we're being requested to come back with a better solution, more general solution for compile time strings. And uh, uh, that means that basically we're not going to be able to do that in standard C++ until at least 20, uh, C++ 20, which personally uh, annoys me very much. But, um, but I, I understand, like, to, like, there are valid reasons why, why people on the committee are not happy with this exact thing. But I don't want to get into that now. Yes? The, yeah, um, we can talk about that later. Um, yeah. Um, can you tell us exactly which part is not is an extension? Uh, line two, three, and four. Three and four. Three and four. Line three and four are ex are, are the, so this form of user defined literal is an extension. What you can have, you can get really close to, it, and, and that's why it's so frustrating. It should almost be a defect report. Um, so the, you can get a char const star. You can get if it's a, if it's not a string literal, if it's like a, a you know integer literal, you can get 
uh, the, the, the char pack, which I showed like, you know, a few slides ago for implementing the underscore C, you can get that. But for some reason, they overlooked that form, which is like the first one I tried, obviously, when user-defined literals came, came out. Um, like they, overload that, they uh, overlooked that specific form where you have basically a, you know, a char T and then a parameter pack of chars for string literals. So that's the, the, the exact form of the user-defined literal. That's the only one that we would care about in this case. We can't do away with other forms, unfortunately, uh, but this one is, is, is a non-standard extension. But anyway, um, so, so yeah. I take it the pointer in length is not good. Uh, and so Marshall asks whether pointer in length uh, does it, and no, uh, because again, I need, and that's, that's the crux of all of this problem. Pointer in length, if I get pointer in length here, I can't possibly, I, within the body of that function, it's not a constant expression. The value of that string is not a constant expression. The pointer and the length are not constant expressions. Return type can't depend on the Therefore, value. yeah, therefore, yeah. the return type of that function cannot depend on the value of the, you know, what is pointed to by the const char and, you know, up to, to my length argument. No, it doesn't work. That would be implementing const uh, uh, parameters. And so we can have this discussion later, okay. but, but it doesn't work. I had to do a context for literal thing, user defined literal for string view. And that takes pointer. Yes, okay. So, so, so okay, so, 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 so later on, I'm going to give you a challenge. It's, it's like, it's very, very, and you're, and you're going to get it instantly. You're going to be like, oh, okay, I understand why I can't do it. Um, uh, and so, no, it wouldn't do it. I, I, we can talk about this later if, if we still have time, actually. Um, all right, so anyway, what we do here is we have this uh, user-defined literal, which is a slightly non-standard extension. There's no such thing as slightly non-standard, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, all, it's standard enough, as far as I'm concerned. And, yeah, and, uh, and essentially what I do is I just, well, I just take these characters, which are the contents of my string literal, and just take that in my string, right? And I, again, bluntly return a, an empt a default constructed, like, object of that type because I don't care about its runtime value or anything like that. And then what I can do is uh, uh, implement all the operators that I, that I, that I want, uh, again, using, just using function template uh, uh, overloading, I guess, here. Uh, and so here, for example, if you want to compare two strings, uh, you just say, oh, are these two types the same, right? Uh, and it's, so it's pretty easy. And then if I want to concatenate those, I just concatenate the parameter packs. Yeah. The question is, does, the slightly, does this user-defined literal uh, include the null terminator? Uh, no, it does not. No, it does not. No, otherwise that would be wrong. Yeah. So th right. therefore it does not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because this works. So, um, Okay, so now that we have a better understanding of uh, compile time strings, uh, we can actually, so I'm just going to, because we took a little bit of time here. So again, this is the use case we're trying to, we're trying to solve, right? So we want to have an event system, and so how are we going to implement that? So first, we're going to create the, the we're going to create the, the event system, uh, and so, uh, well, we don't do much here really, but I'm going to show in the next slide something more interesting, I guess. Um, so the event system is actually pretty simple, given a bunch of events and a bunch of um, of pairs, which, oh, I completely overlooked to show. Just give, just give me a sec. Ooh. So, okay, I'm gonna explain how this part works. Um, unfortunately, I overlooked to, uh, to, uh, to explain how that works. So, underscore E here, um, underscore E here is going to be essentially the same as the underscore S that I created on, on, on the next slide. So it also com com constructs something that's like a compile time string. But it's my own compile time string that I call event, okay? Uh, and then I overload the operator equal so that whatever you assign to it, whatever you assign to it is gonna return a pair of itself, so the, the event itself, and then whatever you assign to it. And then function here just creates a HANA type of the right uh, that contains whatever you stick in it, okay? So essentially, essentially this here creates um, creates basically a pair of a foo compile time string, comma, HANA type containing void string. So I'm just describing a signature 
of the callback that should be associated to that. Okay, yes? Is there a reason that on string doesn't have the same operator for making a pair? Is that a performance issue? Or? Is, there, is there any reason why um, uh, HANA string does not have this operator for creating the pair? Um, it's just because uh, HANA string is supposed to be g general purpose, and this is, I'm implementing a small DSL here, uh, and I, I don't want to like bake that into HANA. It would be, uh, I think it would, would be like not the right place to do that, really. So, um, so what's happening here, essentially, I'm passing a bunch of pairs. I'm doing that in a really fancy way, and I definitely should have included a slide, but uh, essentially here I'm passing a pair with the foo compile time string associated to a type that, that, that represents, that, that contains a signature. Is everybody kind of following that? Okay, um, and so what we do here is we just pattern match on these pairs. So this is exactly what I'm getting from the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, the event equals something. Uh, I'm getting a pair of an event, which is kind of a compile time string, and then a type, a HANA type, basic type here. I'm not getting into these details, but I'm getting a HANA type that represents a signature of the callback that should be associated to that. And then I just create a map with that, okay? And actually, that's not true. I create a map that associates a compile time string to a vector of functions with the provided signature. So what I end up having here is a compile time map from each event, rather a compile time map where each event is mapped to a std vector of std functions with the proper callback signature. Okay, and so when I default construct this here, I'm default constructing that map here, which default constructs the events, well the pairs, which default constructs the events, which I don't care because they're just compile time strings, they're empty, and it default constructs the std vectors which I do care about, so it gives me empty std vectors when my event system is set up. So what I'm doing is, when I set up my event system for the first time, each event is associated to an empty vector that will contain, when you put stuff in it, that will contain uh, functions with the right signature. Is everybody following me at this point? I think it's because I've seen that other slide. <laughs> the one where, you, the, the next one, which you, you've seen a couple of times. Okay, yeah. Maybe you're going to show later, but where's the instance of the vector? Is it hidden in the, in, map? the, the instance of this vector? Yes. The question is, where is the instance of this vector? Um, yes, it's uh, so it's it's a little bit like a std map, right? The, the if you have a std map from std string to a std vector of function, whatever, uh, the this vector of functions is hidden in the uh, mapped type, right? In, in like in the value type, essentially of, of the map. Uh, that's a little bit what happens here. Yeah, uh, Richard. This yeah. question is why this declaration lines one and two uh, because here this is a specialization which allows me to get the pairs uh, so that's why I need that okay good uh, and so now we're going to register an event so given an event we want to say when that event is triggered call that callback right and so what we do is when we get past an event which again is a compile time string and a callback which is presumably anything that can be assigned to a std function with the right type. First, I check whether I know about that event. And the way I do that, I just say map do you contain that event. And since the map knows, the HANA map knows its contents at compile time, and I have a compile time string that represents the event, I, I, I have the value of the event I'm trying to look, to look up at compile time, the result of this contains here can be known at compile time too. And notice that I'm not using constexpr because the point, well, you know, partly the point of this talk is to show that constexpr does not help for the kind of things that we're doing, dealing with here. Um, this contains here returns an integral constant, okay? Um, which, con which being a Boolean integral constant, it knows whether it's true or false at compile time because it's part of its type. And so here the map tells me whether it contains that event and then I can static assert on that. And that actually works, it actually compiles. Um, and even though that's not constexpr, and the reason is very tricky, but we're in Aspen, so I'm going to say what it is. The reason is there is an implicit conversion from this integral constant, which, which is not constexpr. This integral constant is not a constant expression, but there is a, an implicit conversion to the underlying type, so to bool in this case, which is 
const expr. And furthermore, it does not read from the this pointer, which is not a constant expression. Therefore, it does not do anything that is not const expressy. Because it's a static member. It's a static member, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's correct. This is, it's a static, um, so it's a non-member function. It's a static member function. I guess you can say that. Uh, and so I can static assert, I can use that non-constant expression inside a constant expression because really, I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it. I'm not touching the this pointer. You know, compiler, compile that. Um, and so if, if the event is, it was not in my map, was not part of my map, then I, I, I trigger the static assert, right? And so if you, if you mess up, basically you're gonna get the compiler error. And then at this point, after that line, I know that I have something in my map so I go and I just say, okay, um, find that event in my map. And this is what I meant when I said it's pretty nice to just be able to use this uh, bracket operator. It's very natural. So I just say get the value, get a reference to the value associated to that event, which is a vector of std functions with the right signature, and just push, push back that vector, that callback. And if you messed up and you sent me a, a function that does not have the right signature, when you try to push it back, in the vector that has, that has the right signature, you're gonna get like an error inside std function saying you're trying to assign something to me, but like it doesn't have the right signature, right? Is there a reason you're not using in place back? Is there a reason I'm not using in place back? Nope. Mm -hmm. okay. I, was, I was thinking that too. Yeah, I mean, you know, all of this could be like std forward, uh, blah, 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 or in place back could be, but, but then it wouldn't fit on the slide and it would be much more just, you know, and this is a metaprogramming talk. I would like to lower the, ba the, the barrier already. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and then when you want to trigger the event, uh, so again, you get, a, um, you get a, um, an event as a compile time string, and then you say, oh, do I know about this event? If not, then error. And otherwise, you just go for each callback that was registered for that event. You call it, um, Yes, it create it requires, which makes me wonder what's happening because all of this is extracted from code samples which do compile. So now I'm wondering. Uh, do you have another trigger function somewhere? No, I do not. So anyway, so okay, so there is a mistake on this slide. Normally, it should take a, a parent pack of args basically and just pass the args to the callback, but that's the only difference there should be, right? So it just it should just forward the arguments, and I'm gonna. Figure out. Uh, so, is there a, is there a specialization? Is, is there a need for a specialization for an even that yeah, yeah. callback callback that yeah. doesn't that takes nothing? No, it's just an empty parameter pack at this point. Uh, yeah. So anyway, so um, here there should be basically I just should be forwarding the uh, the the args right uh, to the callback. And by the way, the reason why I ask that all the callbacks return void is because. Since I want to have multiple callbacks, if they return something, I need to kind of figure out what to do with all these values. I could like accumulate them or whatever, but it's, it's more complicated for what I want to do. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, why is there a const for trigger? Uh, because I'm not modifying anything here. Hmm? It's just I'm, 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 I'm just triggering the callbacks. So this would fail. This wouldn't work if my callbacks that are part of my map were at a non-const operator parent. But if you do that, sorry. Okay, any question? Does callback need to be const? No, the operator parent of the callback needs to be const here. But if you, if you want to tweak this to allow for non-const, Callbacks, you just remove that const here and you're oh, done. Yeah, but you just captured a non-const callback in your for loop, right? Uh, yeah, it's going to be deduced to const. Yeah, this is going to be. This is actually. Yeah, this is. Uh, this should be. I guess it would be clearer to to say auto construct. Oh, this conference, you know, it doesn't. <laughs> you can't. You cannot possibly get away with anything. All right. Okay. Now. Good thing Sebastian's not here. Yeah. Okay. Any other? Yeah. Question. Yeah. Yeah, we were just thinking that. I did not say you stood forward. You forward them, as in you pass them back. But you do not want to stood forward them because otherwise you're you're going to be double moving sometimes, possibly. Uh, yeah. So that's for sure. You don't want to do that. Um, and actually, the, like the, this should be 
slurped out of my, my, my code samples, but apparently uh, JavaScript is not my friend today. So, um, uh, so, so I'm not forwarding that in the, in the, uh, thank you, in the, in the actual code sample I have. Okay, if there's no more questions, we're going to start the real fun part. <laughs> I hope to have, I, no, we're, we have 30 minutes left. I hope to have uh, 45 minutes. So we're going to do something nifty. We're going to implement Rust traits, like a s subset of Rust traits, but part of Rust traits in C++. And there's not, there's going to be zero macros. So that's usually a hint that there's going to be a ton of metaprogramming. <laughs> Okay, so Rust traits, essentially, um, uh, we, have a, we have a keynote for that, right? But, um, uh, so I define my, my circle here, I define my trait, which says anything. To satisfy this trait, you need a, an area function uh, that takes, you know, just a this argument, essentially, and returns, a, you know, float64. Uh, and then you can implement that trait for a specific type by just providing your implementation and turning it there, okay? Uh, and then when you want to use it, you say uh, print area takes any T which satisfies that trait. And then um, from within the body of that function here, um, you, can, you can use just the, you know, you, you have a generic shape basically and you can just use whatever the trait provides you. So it's kind of like, uh, it, it, it's like related to concepts kind of. Um, however, they can have both dynamic dispatching here or static dispatching. And what we're gonna implement is the dynamic dispatching part. Um, and so here in the main function, you know, I create a circle and then I just print the, its area. And so this is related to Go interfaces, Haskell type classes, C++ OX concept maps, um, uh, virtual concepts, because we're gonna do the, the dynamic version of that. Uh, and we're gonna use a, it's also very closely related to a, it. It basically builds on a technique called type erasure. And that's what we're going to implement. And let's do that in C++. So that's the, and all of this code works. Unless my JavaScript, like, you know, decides to act up, I, I should have all the right code. Uh, and uh, so what we're going to build today, you're going to be able to write that. and It's just going to work. And I would like to point out that this is two lines shorter than the Rust implementation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and so essentially what's happening here, I define my, uh, I'm, I'm kind of che cheating here because they define, you know, the, the circle in three lines, but, <laughs> um, you know, uh, so, so here what happens basically, I define my trait, there's a, that's, that's the same trick as we did before for the small domain specific language. Um, I have a compile time string, I say this compile time string is somehow going to be associated to a function for, with th that signature. Um, and then I just create a trait with that. And then when I want to implement it, I say the as a area trait for a circle is this. And then I map basically my area uh, compile time string to this lambda here, which is the implementation. And obviously this could also be just like, you know, a function pointer or something like that if you want it. Okay. And then the way we're going to use that is we're going to, in main here, we just create a circle. And then when we call print area, there's some magic that goes on. And here you take anything that, it, that satisfies the has area uh, concept. And then given a shape like that, you, yeah, this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. this, 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 could use, this could use the dot operator, okay? But, um, like, and frankly, like you could say, you could say, you could like use, you know, a square bracket, anything. This is just fancy, but you could use anything that, that allows you to, to say shape, go get, call, call the area function, you know, where area is, is defined as a, as a compile time string. So given proper reflection, this would be just trivial and it would just be, uh, most likely we would be able to make it just, you know, that shape, uh, that area, uh, no, 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 no trouble. So this is flexible. I'm not even presenting how that works. It's, it's no big deal, but it's a little uh, uh, overload, overloading trick. The interesting part is what happens basically here. Like this is magic, right? Um, and the reason why we care about that, because the talk said, you know, real world examples, so please, right? Um, this is really, really, really important actually. Um, if you've seen some of Sean Perrin's talks about type erasure and like 
inheritance, the base class of evil or something like that. Uh, if you've seen these talks, um, you kind of know what I'm talking about, but the motivation for this is inheritance as a way to achieve runtime polymorphism is really not great. It has a lot of, uh, you know, it, it has a lot of downsides. Uh, first of all, it is intrusive, right? Because you need to, you, you, the fact that you're using something polymorphically in one place, a type polymorphically in one place, uh, needs to be built in the type itself. It needs to have as a base, it, it needs to have a base class, virtual functions. It's like, this is a completely different story, right? In C++, when you design a type, one choice that you have to make is, is this thing going to be used in a polymorphic way? This is wrong. It should be this, I have my type, and oh, by the way, over there, I need to use it in a polymorphic way, so there I figure out how to do that. But no, you need to bake this in the design of the class. So that's really intrusive. It's incompatible with value semantics because you end up moving pointers all around the place, uh, and then if you want to, you know, if you copy one of these things, well, you haven't copied anything, you copied a reference to it, so, so if you want to do better, you need to create a clone function and do it yourself. It's a complete mess. Uh, it's also tightly coupled with dynamic storage because essentially what we do is we, you know, put that on the heap, then take a pointer to it, and, and you know, we call it a day. Um, it's not great, right? There's no reason why we need to do that, actually. Uh, and it's also slow in the sense that sometimes your use case could, if, if, you, if you wrote it like, if you wrote assembly, for example, by yourself, you, or, or just like even straight C, uh, you could do much better because you know about your use case. So you could like, you know, use uh, buffers with fixed sizes and then be like, I'm just gonna throw objects of this type in that buffer and I know they're all gonna fit. And then you don't need the indirection to the heap. And like, you could do all kinds of crazy tricks, right? And you could like have tables with function pointers in them. Um, uh, and so none of this can be achieved with vanilla, um, vanilla inheritance and virtual functions. Uh, and since we're going to build our own vtables, we can achieve that. And there's a full library uh, called Dino, which implements what, basically what we're going to what, what we're going to see today and more. Uh, but now let's see how that works under the hood. That's that's the whole point of this talk. Uh, it's actually pretty easy. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> frankly, uh, yeah, frankly, this, this is really difficult, but it's going to be a lot of fun too, I think. So um, we're going to take it slowly. Um, essentially, actually, we're going to take it pretty fast because uh, we're almost, almost you know, out of time. So uh, I define my small domain-specific language here. So just the same thing as what I explained uh, earlier, basically. Uh, I have a compile time string. Uh, and then when you, a function here is just a variable template that creates a HANA basic type. I overload the operator equal to create a pair, okay? Uh, and then the same usual trick with the uh, user-defined literal. And then struct self here just represents the thing that I'm going to erase in my, in my signature, essentially. It represents the type of the this pointer, which I don't know what it is because I'm doing uh, dynamic, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing like a um, runtime polymorphism. So it's the type of the, it's the most, de it represents the most derived type basically that I, that I have at runtime. That's what it represents. And so given that, um, if I say trait like this, it's ex essentially as if I was creating a HANA pair like that. Yep. Is a trait, um, does, it, does a trait mean it has that function or can you also require multiple uh, the question is, can you require multiple functions? You can require multiple functions. You can even require, you can even, um, you even have like trait uh, refinement. Uh, so you can say, uh, uh, for example, I have a full hierarchy of iterators and you're like, uh, you know, iterator is a copy constructible, blah, 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 blah. Then forward iterator is uh, just iterator plus some stuff. And, and yeah, it just figures all the, it creates a vtable and, and everything. Um, so that's for the, the domain specific language. Trait here. Um, it's pretty easy. Uh, so again, here I'm just passing a bunch of pairs to my trait function. So I, I just stick that in a tuple for now. And we're going to use that later. We're going to see how, how we're going to reuse these, these uh, methods later, right? Okay. And then I, well, actually, next slide here. So when I do this, essentially what I'm doing, I'm just inheriting from this thing that represents my interface from this type that represents my interface. And internally, if I were to instantiate, like to create an object of has area type, um, there would be like, a, I, I could like default construct a, a, a stupid tuple that represents the type of my methods. Okay. Um, 
And so now that we have a description of the trait, so we have that part essentially done, right? So we have a way to describe the, 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 uh, the interface that, that we're interested in. Um, we're gonna go get the implementation of the trait, okay? And that's actually very easy too. Um, so we just use a map. We just, you know, boom, HANA map, done. And then this impl here is a variable template like this, which you can specialize. And so you associate a HANA map to a specialization of the impl. Everybody's following me? Okay. And again, remember this definition here. So therefore, when I say make impl, all I'm doing is I'm just creating a map and mapping, essentially associating this compile time string to that actual concrete implementation for that type. Yes? Um, what is the namespacing here? Like, is the impl supposed to be in the uh, dino namespace, or is it supposed to be in the same namespace that your trait is? So the question is, what is the namespacing here? Is uh, impl supposed to be in the dino namespace or in the, uh, yeah, it's, it's supposed to be in the, in the dino namespace. But actually here, this is a minimal re-implementation in a, for, you know, in, for the purpose of these code samples, uh, which, and that's in the global namespace. But normally, if it were dino, you would say dino, colon, colon, blah, 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 um, right? And actually, the, yeah. But for the usage, is it has, uh, the trait is defined in, like, so I, create the trait has area, do I put that in my own sort of yeah. namespace and yep. then circle itself as its own other namespace? Yeah. So you create a trait wherever you want, the, the, the circle wherever you want, and the only thing that you need to, that is namespace specific, is when you say impl, when you go specialize the variable template, I have to put that somewhere, and so it's gonna be in dino, colon, colon, impl, and then you're gonna say my namespace as area, my other namespace circle, and then just define it. They could all be in the same namespace too, it doesn't matter. Um, can we talk about that later? Um, so now we have both of these, these uh, essentially we have both of these structures, right? We have both of these pieces of information in place. We haven't done anything yet. <clears throat> and this is where it becomes really interesting. Have you wondered what the hell happens here? There's gotta be something crazy because I'm passing in a circle to this thing which is not a circle. It's also not a template. How does that compile? Magic, that's correct. <laughs> and this is where we're gonna see that like most examples are pretty easy and they just need like HANA map and then you know you look it up, you look something in, a, in it, you look something up in it and you're done and like that's it, you know, we home, right? But um, now we're actually gonna do some heavy lifting with the algorithms of HANA much, much more than we usually do. And this is where it becomes much harder. But we're in Aspen, so hopefully you knew it, you know, it was gonna be a, a hard slope. <laughs> so let's see how poly is implemented. And again, there's some simplification going on here because of time, but poly, you define that on a trait. So you say like, I'm, I'm anything, it's like an any, really. It's like an any or a, a, a little bit like a stub function in some sense too. It's like an any, but that's anything that supports this trait interface, okay? And so given, um, since I'm constructing my poly from a circle, I somehow need to have a, like a templated constructor to say like you can be constructed from anything, right? And so that's what's happening here. Uh, obviously the true implementation doesn't use void star and doesn't leak its stuff, but now we don't wanna concentrate on that. Um, and what I do is I'm gonna create the V table for that type and that trait, and I'm gonna store that in my poly. And you can just store a pointer to your vtable if you want, you can do anything, right? But, but this is just for the metaprogramming part, for showcasing the metaprogramming part here, uh, you initialize the vtable uh, from the, the static map of methods to concrete implementations. Okay, is everybody kind of clear on how that works? Kind of. Okay, um, and then this operator stuff just goes into the vtable, this, you know, when I do the magic thing, I just, I just go in the vtable and then, and then call the function that's there, that I find, find there. So I'm assuming that vtable somehow has a kind of mappy interface that I can use, okay? And now we're gonna create our own vtable. So the way I do that is, um, given a trait, I'm gonna 
write a function that figures out the V table layout for that trait. So I have a bunch of interface, it's basically the same as if you declare your base class with virtual functions in it, and the compiler looks at those and is like, uh, okay, so I've got like a function with this name and it has this signature, and then a function with that name and that signature, and somewhere it figures out that you are gonna need a V table with that layout, you know, that number of function pointers and function pointers to what and whatever. So I just do the same thing here. I figure out the V table layout, it's gonna be a HANA map, because it's convenient. Uh, and then, given an actual implementation, given an actual impl, I'm gonna take that impl, uh, which is all statically dispatched at this point, right? I have a, a concrete function which knows that it's getting a circle, and I'm gonna magically extract a function that takes in like a void pointer, and knows that it's, it, it, you know, it, it, it knows that it's getting actually a, a, a const reference to a circle, and it's gonna uncast that, that basically and pass that to the concrete implementation. So this is kind of like the layer between the generic interface and the, the rather the runtime interface and the compile time known, the, the functions where the types are known at compile time. And then that's the operator um, bracket. Yeah, thanks. Um, and so the first step is to determine the vtable layout. That's where HANA comes in handy. So I have a trait, I have a bunch of methods because I set them, set them there uh, previously, right? And so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna transform the methods. Remember the methods are, this is just a tuple of pairs. So I iterate over my tuple of pairs. This is the first, um, this is a, the, the first element of my pair, the second element of my pair. HANA fuse just allows me to take a pair and decompose it a little bit like structured bindings, but without structured bindings. Um, so I go over my methods. This is the name of the method, and this is the signature, which is a HANA type that represents the signature of my, so that's your function, of my method. Right? That's my function. That exactly, that is the, yeah. So this part is, is the name of the method, and that is the function part that I put in my trait call. And then I, I take that out of the object world, back into the type world, because I'm gonna need it, and then I erase the signature, so that's where I do the type erasure of the function. I take a function that takes a, this should show self actually. Um, so this should show self constref and it, it translates that basically to a void constar. Something that takes a void constar, right? Uh, and then I just return basically, um, I just return a pair, rather the type of a pair that associates that function to a function pointer of the erase type. So I'm creating essentially the, the um, I'm taking the placeholders in the function that you put and I'm saying, okay, if you're like a const, if you're like a self const ref, this is gonna be erased into a void const star. If you're a self ref, it's gonna be a void star. If it's a self star, it's gonna be a void star too. Uh, you know, and so I'm, I'm doing essentially the, the, what the compiler has to do under the hood. Uh, and then what I do is I just, so now I, what I have is a, a bunch of pairs that represent the erase type of my functions and I just put that in a map. And so I've got a map that maps method, type, method names rather to actual function pointers that, um, to actual function pointers that are, that are the contents of my V table. Is everybody following me? Need more time on that slide? Okay. So the, so the input here is the trait, which is the thing that I defined, trait parens, um, uh, you know, area equals, uh, I'm, I return a double and I take a self construct. Okay, and the result of that is a HANA map, which, which basically says to area, you need a, associated to area, you need a function pointer that returns a double and takes in a void const star, which is the, the whatever runtime object that you're gonna have when you get called. Yes? Uh, and uh, if you had a signature, if you had a trait that took in not just self, but self and additional arguments, uh, would the sort of erase signatures just- They would not be erased. So if I were to add, if I were to have like, uh, if, if my function signature was something like self const ref comma stood string, for example, the resulting, the resulting signature here would be double void const star comma stood string because this is not polymorphic. Right. 
It's just saying like, it's, it's just like, a, I'm just erasing the this pointer of the virtual method here. That's exactly what I'm doing. Okay. Um, and then the other part, so, so now we have like erased the interface. We have the V table layout. We need to fill it with something, right? So given a concrete set of methods that implement my, my trait, I'm going to need to, um, I'm going to need basically to, to put that in my, to generate an, a V table that is a concrete model of my layout, V table layout that I, that I uh, uh, calculated in my previous slide. And so again, I transform the methods, but at this point I have a concrete implementation. I transform my methods and for each um, method, there is the function signature again, and the name of the method. And what I do is I just erase the function. So that is different from the erase signature as in it creates, a sh it creates a, like a trampoline. This thing here essentially returns, this is a function basically that takes in like a void const star, returns a double, what it does, it takes the incoming void const star, it knows that it's for a t, um, it knows that it's for a t because my implementation here is for a t. And it casts the void const star to a t const ref, and it passes back down, passes that you know, down to the, the actual implementation that I had, which was my, uh, my circle area, you know, uh, 3, 3 point, uh, 15, 16, uh, it's un erasing. It's it's un -erasing. Un -erasing. Um, so yes, so I take a statically dis dispatched function and I erase it into a you know, dynamic kind of uh, function with the dynamic signature. <laughs> this is really hard to talk about, but, uh, and so the process that it needs to, to do is actually un erase, right? So I erase the thing, but to erase the thing, the thing has to un erase its arguments. So this is actually exactly the uh, terminology that I use inside that implementation. It's like I have like unerases and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Is it anything more than a reinterpret cast of the pointer? Is it anything more than a reinterpret cast of the pointer? Um, yes. Uh, uh, well, you don't want to reinterpret cast stuff like that. It's better to. Uh, um, so yeah, it's more than that because like if if you have like a pointer for like there's some logic because it, like there's a pointer for example uh, I pass that as a void pointer but you want to get that back as a as a um, as a circle pointer but if it's uh, uh, if you're expecting a circle const ref for example I'm still getting a void const pointer but I'm erasing that as so I do two things I say okay now you're a circle const pointer and then oh circle const ref. So there's more logic than, than just reinterpret casting stuff. And you can't, oh, you're saying reinterpret casting the function pointer. Yes. No, that doesn't work. I, um, I remember looking up the standard and it would be undefined behavior. So that's why I'm, I'm taking all this. Uh, uh, yeah, it would be undefined behavior to, to cast function pointers uh, to invalid, to, in, to different function pointer types and to use them as if they were, it, it doesn't just work. All right, another way to ask the same thing. Does it compile into a single instruction? Does it compile into a single instruction? Um, yes, it should compile into a single instruction. I haven't checked that. I have a lot of benchmarks, but specifically that question, I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna keep going, I have seven minutes. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, all right. So basically, I erase a function, and then I end up with an actual map that has, um, um, I actually end up with a map which maps names to actual function pointers, right? And from that I can assign, because that fits my vtable layout, I can assign that thing to my vtable in my poly. Because I have vtable with the, the same layout and then I've just coerced my impl into something that has a red layout, so I can just assign to it. And so I've created my vtable layout, I've erased my, my actual uh, functions, and so I can assign to that. And then uh, here I explain how I support refinements. I'm just gonna show the slides real quick because I don't think we have time for that. For that. Uh, uh, it becomes more difficult a little bit, but um, I guess the interesting part is this here, essentially, where you have some kind of, a, uh, where you, you have an implementation, but you wanna, you wanna implement, you have an implementation block, but you wanna look into the refined implementation blocks to go check whether there are methods that are, that are, that are left there. For example, in this example, let's say I implement just the, um, 
the impulse for iterator and like you know std vector iterator for example i don't want to have to to implement the copy constructible so the library is going to have to go look in all the refined the refined traits and look at all this the impulse for these refined traits and 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 complete essentially the the impulse uh, itself and that's what it's doing so there's some kind of a you know, uh, folding and like I take the union of my impulse and, and go recursively and find all the refinements. And so that's kind of like a depth first search in the refinement tree. And then I just union all of this and I end up with a big, big impulse that contains all the, ref the, 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 the methods for the refined things, including just for that trait. So anyway, uh, fortunately, no time for that, but um, this is a neat bit of, uh, of code, I think. And so after that, you can congratulate yourself, right? So that's exactly what, what you've done, right? You've done the, the job of compiler. And the result is uh, you can define something like this here. For example, so you declare a trait that is a callable, anything that returns R, and takes a bunch of args. And, and so actually that answers your question, I think, Richard. Uh, these args here are not gonna be, thanks, are not gonna be erased. But the self here is going to be erased, is going to be passed under the hood, is going to be passed as a void const star, which is exactly what your compiler is doing. Uh, and then I implement for anything that's, uh, here I should, I should be more strict, I, I should say, you know, whatever, if a std is callable or whatever, uh, but I'm being bold. So, uh, so you implement the trait, I implement the trait for anything, and that's the default implementation, and then you've got std function right here. It, and it's not missing much, really. Uh, and so the way this, is, this library is meant to be used is not so much as, like I never expect anyone to write that in their code. I expect people though, hopefully, to go and create wrappers on top of that library that provide the proper semantics for their type, but all the heavy lifting of how to, of how to define the V tables and how to, uh, to deal with object lifetime is all handled by the, by the library. And then you just throw in your light interface on top of that. And so this is not a, a talk about Dino, but by the way, you can like, you have V table policy, so you can decide whether the V table is held on the stack, partly on the stack, on the heap, uh, not on the heap, sorry, like in a, in a data segment, uh, which is the case for normal V tables. Uh, you can decide whether you want to have the storage, the object itself, on the stack, on the heap, uh, sometimes on the stack, sometimes on the heap, just a reference to it. So you can have like polymorphic views. Um, you can have like polymorphic views over, over objects that live on the stack, for example, and you're, you're not owning them. So you could pass in like a function object without making ever, any copy. And so actually they're talking about a std function ref right now. So with, with this library, because we have so much control over everything, Implementing function ref from this is literally comma, um, dino column column um, uh, reference storage policy something like that, and that and you're done. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip this, which was generating JSON, but everybody knows that, and I'm gonna get to talk for two minutes about the future. Um, so, what should metaprogramming look like? Uh, so we imagine. Uh, we want to serialize something to JSON. Um, we could get something along those lines. Essentially, uh, the idea is if we could reflect on a type and somehow get the list of members of that type <laughs> and then somehow iterate at compile time over that compile time sequence. Uh, so you could do that with HANA using like HANA for each, for example. But Language support might even be nicer, who knows? Um, you could do something like this, right? Um, and, and now for type level, so that's like, that has runtime FX, right? This is like actually, you know, printing stuff. Um, but for type level calculations, uh, what we're thinking of right now is expanding the capabilities of constexper, of constant expressions to, um, to allow using things like std vector. And if you get that, you can use most of the standard algorithms. And if you have something like a meta type, which represents a type at compile time, um, you can do, uh, well, you know, hopefully you can do some type level calculations, all the type level calculations that we can do right now. Um, so this is not HANA. This is actually, I think, much better than HANA uh, because it, well, they solve a slightly different problem though because you can't have runtime side effects with this, whereas you can with HANA. But for the type level part, this I think beats anything else, you know, hands down, because 
you're just all doing const expert calculations. You, you're stating your intent very clearly in standard C++ to the compiler, and hopefully the compile time should be much faster, and it's obviously much easier to read for anyone. I mean, this is just a normal std vector, and this is just a std sort, and these are iterators, and I'm doing all of that at compile time, right? So like, we're super used to that. Uh, and so the steps I see to get there is to expand const expert evaluation to allow some sorts of allocation. And um, that allows us to implement, basically to use the vector at compile time. Uh, and then create a way to represent types at compile time, not like HANA type, which has a different object type for each T that you put in there, but really as have like a, essentially like a compile time type ID uh, where whatever you stick in there you still get a std meta type, so you can put them in vectors. Whereas HANA type, you can put that in a vector because you would need to have a vector that contains objects of different types. And that's the, the big problem. And internally, this is essentially implemented as a, a pointer to an AST node uh, by you know, the, the implementations that, that are being written right now. Um, this is what happens, so this is really fast. Uh, and then we need a way, given a stood meta type like that, we need a way to go back to an actual C++ type so that we can do anything useful with it. And hopefully, um, uh, I don't think it's strictly necessary, but I think it would be really useful if we can actually take a context per sequence and put it back into a parameter pack so that we can say, we can combine that, for example, by saying, I have my sorted sequence of, of, type I, of meta types. I get back a C++ type, and then I dot, 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 I expand that anywhere I want. Right? And essentially that gives you the bridge between the real C++ type system and the uh, kind of uh, computationally rich uh, constexper enabled uh, world. And so that's pretty much the end. Uh, I think metaprogramming is powerful. I mean, we've done something kind of crazy here, uh, uh, you know, imp implementing our own V tables and that's just, just, you know, just one, one thing like that, right? Uh, it is pretty powerful. Uh, it's much better than it used to be, really. Like, imagine doing this five years ago, and it's probably it's probably possible, but it's probably really, really, really hard. Um, and I think the future is really looking good. Uh, we're working really hard to uh, try to, you know, figure out how reflection and compile time programming should work. And I think we're gonna, uh, you know, get a nice solution that's gonna solve a lot of these, make it, that's gonna make solving these problems much easier than it is right now. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.